May Allah grant us in this dunya his ziyarah and in the next life his shafa'ah. During the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, tens of thousands of people embraced Islam. They left their families, their tribes, their lofty positions that they had in their societies and communities, and they joined Rasulullah. Sometimes they would join Rasulullah only after their family abandoned them. They would threaten them that if you join Rasulullah's religion, you will be excommunicated. But yet thousands rushed to join this beautiful religion of the Holy Prophet. Now the question is this, what attracted all those individuals? What was their motive? What motivated them? to come and sacrifice their lives for this religion, for this man, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now, for some of them, it may have been the philosophical and intellectual arguments that the Holy Prophet used to use. At the end of the day, the Holy Quran is filled with knowledge. It's filled with treasures. And simply put, Islam makes sense. There are no contradictions. There, are, there is nothing in the Holy Quran. And simply put, Islam makes sense. Some people, some of the companions of Rasulullah, maybe that's why they joined the religion of Islam. But most of them, that was not their motive. That's not what attracted them to Islam. For most of the companions of Rasulullah that the Holy Quran says, And you saw people by the hundreds, by the thousands, joining the religion of Allah, entering the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The main motive for most individuals was the akhlaq of Rasulullah, the virtuous character of this messenger. Number one, the Holy Prophet was honest and trustworthy. He was truthful. He was called As-Sadiqul Amin. He had never ever told a lie. Everyone could trust Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam with their lives, with their children, with their money and everything they had because he was a trustworthy individual. So obviously after 40 days that you've built such a reputation as a, as a truthful, honest and trustworthy person, now, when the Prophet comes and says, I have been sent as a messenger, it's much easier for people to accept your message because you have that clean reputation. That's number one. Number two, you find that the Holy Prophet was merciful and kind with everyone around him. He was the nicest person that you could meet. Anyone that would go and meet Rasulullah would be so surprised at how gentle, how soft-spoken, how nice Rasulullah was. He would never yell at anyone. He would never scold anyone. He would never rebuke anyone. He would never make anyone feel bad. He would never um, disappoint anyone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was the nicest person you could meet. In one tradition, his servant, Anas ibn Malik, he says, I served Rasulullah for seven years and not once did Rasulullah yell at me. Not once did he rebuke me. Why did you do this? Why didn't you come on time? Why didn't you do that? You see, when people have servants, they yell at them so much because they don't do what they want. Rasulullah never, ever, never, ever yelled at Anas ibn Malik, his servant. The Holy Quran says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ that you were so gentle, Ya Rasulullah, with your people. You were so gentle, you were so merciful, you were so kind with them. And if it was not for that, the Quran says, if you were vulgar with them, if you were rude with them, they would have all left you. No one would have stayed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I don't care how many miracles you would have showed them. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you had. When you don't, treat people with kindness, then they will run away from you. 
This is number two. And number three, what was so beautiful about the Holy Prophet and so unique about him was that he was caring, compassionate, and empathetic with his people. The Holy Quran speaks about this. Allah says in the Holy Quran, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَلِبْتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ The Holy Quran says that we have sent you. Allah says that we have sent a messenger from amongst you. And when you are from that people, from that tribe, you're going to love them. They're all your friends and family members. You're, they're your people. Allah didn't send someone from a distant country where he wouldn't care about these people. No, he was born amongst you. He was raised with you. So he cares about this land. He cares about this heritage. And he cares about the people of this land. And then the Quran explains why. Azizun alayhi ma the Holy Prophet was empathetic, meaning when they suffered, Rasulullah suffered. When they were in pain, Rasulullah was in pain. Harisun alaykum. He was so caring for you. He wanted the best for you. Anytime Rasulullah did anything for you, he told you do this or don't do that, it's because he loves you. Rasulullah is haris, he loves you. And then, bil mu'minina ra'ufun rahim. And finally, he is compassionate and merciful with you. So he would never want to burden you with this new religion. Don't think that he was sent to make your life miserable or to make it more difficult. No, Rasulullah cares for you. He loves you and he wants what's best for you. And that's why the Holy Quran says about the Holy Prophet, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Oh Rasulullah, your akhlaq are truly extraordinary. Your akhlaq, your virtuous character is sublime. It's It's so great, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling it Azim. Can you imagine that Allah is testifying about the Prophet that his character is unbelievable. It's so beautiful. It's extraordinary. So it was the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that was the main factor that drove those people in the hundreds and the, and the thousands to come and embrace this religion because they loved the character of Rasulullah, his personality. And that's why, brothers and sisters, if there is one lesson that we learn from all of that, it's this, that you don't necessarily have to have knowledge to invite people to your faith. Some people think that I have to be a scholar. I have to go to Hausa Seminary. I have to learn, become a Sayyid, a Sheikh. Only then I can propagate for Islam. I can invite people to my religion. Not necessarily, brothers and sisters. Even if I don't have knowledge about my religion, I can still attract people to my faith like Rasulullah. How? Through good character, through my actions, through my good actions and good words, and just presenting myself in a kind and generous way will be the best way that I attract people to my faith. And an Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam speaks about this in a hadith. He says, Kunu du'atan Lana The Imam says that be silent propagators. Invite people to our faith, but not through your tongue. You don't have to speak. You don't have to lecture people about the Quran, about the beliefs of Islam and the creeds that you hold. No. Kunu du'atam Through your actions, you don't even have to speak. Let your actions speak for you because they speak much more loudly than your words do. And they are a much better attraction than your words are. And then the Imam says, When they see you, let them see the virtues of Ahlul Bayt through your actions. Let them see the kindness and generosity through your actions. That's the best way to attract them. And then the Imam says in another hadith, فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ مِنْكُمْ إِذَا وَرِعَ فِي دِينِهِ وَصَدَقَ الْحَدِيثِ وَأَدَّ الْأَمَانَ وَحَسَّنَ خُلُقَهِ مَعَ النَّاسِ قِيلَ هَذَا أَدَبْ جَعْفَ The Imam said, when you present yourself in a virtuous, very respectful, courteous way, when you are a trustworthy person, you're honest, you have the best akhlaq, you smile, you're very nice with people, people will say, هَذَا أَدَبُ جَعْفَ this is 
the discipline of Ja'far, meaning it is their leader, Imam Sadiq, that taught them this. So it will all reflect back on your faith. So the greatest service you can do to your faith is just to present yourself in a nice way. That will reflect back at your faith. People will say, wow, Prophet Muhammad must be a very good teacher of these Muslims because they're the best people. And then the Imam said, and then I'll be happy because just through your actions, you'll be helping me. You'll be helping my cause, the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Imam said, But the opposite is also true. If you do not present yourself in a virtuous way, no, I cheat people and deceive them and lie. And I commit every single vice that I can. And I don't even say that I'm a Muslim. Just the fact that people know I'm a Muslim, I'm a follower of Imam Sadiq, that's a disservice to the Imam. Because the Imam will say, look at the followers of Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. Look at the followers of Prophet Muhammad. They are the worst people. Look at Muslims. They are the worst people. Look at the followers of Musa ibn Ja'far al kazim that we commemorate his shahada, his martyrdom tonight. They are the worst people. So the Imam says, you can attract people to your faith through your akhlaq, and likewise, you can repel them through your akhlaq. So be careful. Everything you do in your society, in your community, you are sending messages all the time. Don't think that you only represent yourself. Like it or not, every human being represents himself and his faith in one way or another. Now, it's wrong, it's wrong to generalize, stereotype, and if someone commits a mistake, you know, we blame the religion, but that's how human beings are. When someone does good, we say, wow, he must be, his religion must teach him that. And when he does something bad, likewise, they say his religion. So we have to be extra careful when it comes to this point. And Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam has a beautiful story that happened during his life. And he illustrates how we can invite people to our faith without saying a word, just by presenting ourselves through kindness and generosity. And Imam al kadhim salam lived in the city of al Medina. In the city of al Medina, there was a man who was a Nasibi. Nasibi is someone that hates Ahlul Bayt, like your present day ISIS and the Wahhabis, who hates Imam Ali, hates Ahlul Bayt. So this man used to always cause trouble for Imam al kadhim Anytime he would see him, he would disrespect him, he would offend him, he would use profanity with, with him and insult him. So his companions of the imam, they were frustrated one day. They joined together in the masjid. They said, you know what? Enough is enough. This man has been insulting our imam for no reason. We can't put up with this. What should we do? One of them said, let's kill him. Let's kill him and get rid of him. He's an enemy. Let's get rid of him. So that was their idea. And when you have an enemy, how do you resolve your problem with this enemy? How do you get rid of this enemy? By killing him. So they went to Imam al kadhim to seek permission. We want to go and kill this evil Nasubi that disrespects you all the time. The Imam right away said, no, 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 no. This is a terrible idea. Terrible idea to go and kill him. You know what type of message that will send towards my faith and the, the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, salam, that anyone we don't like, anyone we disagree with, anyone that disrespects us, we go and kill him? No. This is the faith of the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. Not Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Ahlul Bayt, they are the embodiment of virtue. So the Imam says, I have a better idea. What is it? The Imam said, I'll take care of it. The next day, the Imam asked, where does this man live? They told him he has a farm in the outskirts of Medina. So the Imam, he went on his mule, on uh, the mule, and he went towards the farm of that individual. As the imam approached the farm, he noticed the man was outside taking care of his farm. So the imam went inside his property. The man looked and he said, stop, don't come. You're going to kill my grass. You're going to kill my crops. You're going to walk over them. But the imam continued to come. He was so furious. He began to insult the imam. Look at what you've done now. The imam hadn't done anything. He was just being rude with the imam. So the imam arrived. He came down from his mule. He looked at the man. And he just smiled in his face. You know what one smile can do, brothers and sisters? It can diffuse. Just read about it. Read about the psychological implications of, of just a smile and the benefits. A smile, they say, is contagious. 
when you're feeling bad and you want to frown, but you see someone smiling at you. That smile is contagious. You're going to also feel inclined to smile back at that person. So it diffuses animosity. This is what a smile, the imam just smiled at him. And then the imam told him, look, this crop of yours that you claim I may have crushed or killed, how much was it worth? He says, maybe a hundred dinars. How much did you anticipate making by selling this crop? He said, I don't know. He said, how much do you think? He said, I hoped maybe 200. The imam took a bag with 300 dinars and he gave it to the man that used to insult him every day for no reason, just because he has animosity towards Ahl Bayt This man was surprised. The Sunasabi was stunned. And he felt so terrible that all these days and months I have showed this man poison, but now he is giving me this gift and he's smiling in my face. Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters, human beings, when when you this is how we are programmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When someone treats us with kindness, we are forced, we unwillingly love that individual. That's how we human beings are. Even if that individual is 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 an enemy, but when he starts to show you kindness, you're gonna love that individual, especially when it's sincere and genuine kindness. They don't want anything. They just wanna do it because their essence is kind and generous. So this man, all of a sudden, he felt so bad and he kissed the forehead of an Imam al kazim Ali and he told, and he told him, forgive me, I have been so rude, so disrespectful with you. Unfortunately, I was brainwashed and I thought that you were an evil person, but now I have realized that you truly are a man of God, that you see all this poison, but yet you give, all you give back is generosity and kindness and virtue. So, the next day, this enemy, he turned into a friend. All of a sudden, the companions, they used to gather in the masjid so that the imam could teach them. So the companions of Imam al kazim came and they saw that this man, they saw this man was an enemy. Now all of a sudden, he has, he, he has joined the class of Imam al kazim and he, he's waiting for the Imam to come. So they, they asked him, what are you doing here? He said, I'm waiting for my master, Musa ibn Jafar. What? They were so confused. They went to Imam al kazim They asked him, what's going on? The Imam alayhi salam told them, I'll tell you. So the Imam sat down with them. Told him, remember, you guys said we have a problem. We need a solution. Your solution was violence. Let's kill him. I had a much better solution. Instead of killing him, let's make him into a, a friend. Let's make him into one of us. So I went to him and he told him the story. I used kindness. I used generosity. I used good words. And I was able to transform an enemy to a friend. Brothers and sisters, Al Imam Al Kazim alayhi salam did not lecture that man. Oh man, you've been brainwashed. The Quran speaks about Ahl al in this verse and that verse. And my grandfather, Imam Ali, was the rightful Khalifa and his Khilafa was usurped. Sometimes logic just doesn't work with some people when they're brainwashed because there's a barrier, because they're blind. Some people, they're blind. Their hearts is blind. Even if you show them the clear proof, they cannot see it because that animosity that they have blinds them from seeing the proof. So sometimes you, you, you just can't use logic. And Imam al kazim alayhi salam, all he did was an act of kindness. He went and he forgave that man and he showed him some nice words and smiles and that man transformed. Allahu Akbar. And this is exactly what the Quran says. The Holy Quran says, Itfa' billati hiya ahsan. The Holy Quran says anytime you have a problem, you have an enemy, always use good means. Use nice ways. Use kindness. And then all of a sudden you'll notice that enemy. When you use these kind ways, when you use kindness, that enemy will transform into a friend. What a beautiful way that the Quran teaches us. And an Imam al kazim indeed shows us that this is true. That when you use kindness with Enemies, this is the best way to attract them to your faith. What a beautiful lesson that Imam al kazim alayhi salam showed us, brothers and sisters. Now, unfortunately, we have the same problem here living in the U.S. There's many people who are Islamophobes. 
But those individuals that have these negative sentiments towards Islam, most of them, they're brainwashed. They're not evil. Most of them have no idea what the true message of Islam is, what they see on Fox News and the media. They believe it. And especially when you have fear mongers and evil individuals like Trump who try to play on this fear and they try to persuade people that Islam is an evil religion, Islam is ISIS, Islam is a religion of terrorism, they're going to buy this propaganda. So with such individuals, brothers and sisters, we have to use the same ways that our imams use, and that is kindness. We have to attract them. We have to dispel all these accusations and misconceptions, not by lecturing them, not by going on the pulpits and giving lectures. For some of them, yes, that may help. But for the vast majority, it will be our akhlaq, the most important element that will attract people to our faith is our akhlaq and how we present ourselves. And we have to learn these days, brothers and sisters. There was a story I read a couple of years ago in Charlotte. A bunch of Islamophobes wanted to protest in front of a masjid in Charlotte. So a woman narrates her story. She says, I showed up on Friday during their Friday prayer, holding the ban ban banners against Islam. She says, they didn't show up. It was just me. I said, I'm still going to protest. She had a microphone and get out, get out of our country, Muslims. Go back to your countries. You terrorists, you this, you that. So in the masjid, the coordinators and the um, uh, the board of trustees, they got together and they said, what should we do? Should we call the cops? Some said, let's go and beat her up. Everyone gave a solution. SubhanAllah, just like the story of Imam al when we have a problem, we have an enemy. But there was a woman that was very wise and she followed the Quran where she followed the beautiful stories of an Imam al kazim alayhi salam and examples that they have, the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt have said. And she said, don't worry, I have the solution. She went out and she began to approach and approach and approach that lady. When she came close, the lady was afraid. She just hugged. She hugged that lady. She hugged that lady. That lady, she narrates her story. She says, as soon as that Muslim hijabi hugged me, she said, subhanAllah, as if miraculously, all that tension, all that hatred and animosity that I had towards Muslims was all drained out, diffused. It's like there was a fire and it was put off. She said, I felt that this Muslim is a human being like me. She hugged me. She smiled at me. And then she told me, come on inside, please. Let's have some coffee. She said, the... The banners, they drop, the microphone, they drop from my head. I could not say no. Remember, when you show kindness to someone, they cannot say no. That's how Allah created and programmed us. She took her inside the masjid. They had coffee and they began to speak. She says, ever since that day, I became a friend of those Muslims. And now my job is to go and diffuse and dispel those misconceptions. And I go to those anti-Muslim rallies, and I tell them, you're wrong, this is propaganda, Muslims have been, uh, you know, wrongfully accused, so I'm a soldier for Islam. Now, she didn't convert, but we don't need her to con convert, she's an ally now. They turned an enemy into an ally who is spending her time and her energy and efforts on social media and on the ground to dispel these misconceptions regarding Muslims. The Holy Quran says, always use the good ways, always use good manners, wise ways, always use kindness, because it's like magic. It will turn an enemy into a friend. And Imam al kazim alayhi salam taught us that through his teachings, and thus we have to follow in his footsteps, brothers and sisters. And Imam al kazim alayhi salam during his time, he led the best example, the most beautiful example for his companions and for his Shia. And unfortunately, Imam al kazim paid a hefty price. And Imam al kazim alayhi salam was imprisoned for years. Why? What did Imam al kazim do? For, for what crime was he imprisoned? And Imam al kazim was not a political man. He never spoke against the government. He never mobilized. He never committed any crime. Do you know why Harun al-Abbasi, the Khalifa of that time, prisoned him? Because an Imam al kazim would shine more and more every day through his excellency, through his character. And he saw him, that he, he, he posed a challenge to an Imam, to Harun. Harun saw that an Imam al kazim alayhi salam, 
posed a threat to his kingdom because he is shining brighter than I am. I should be the talk of the town. I should be who everyone's speaking about, not Musa ibn Ja'far. So the best way is to detach him from the community, is to remove him and imprison him. For years, and Imam al-Kadhim was far away from his companions in the dungeons of Harun al-Abbasi, this evil dictator. He would be sent to a prison, but eventually after a couple of weeks or months, the prisoner, whoever was in charge, they would let an Imam al-Kadhim go, they would let him relax, and they would not you know, be cruel, they'd be so humane with him. Why? Because they would see the piety, they would see the worship of an Imam al-Kadhim, they would see that this man is a man of God. Why is Harun prisoned him? So they would allow him to <clears throat> be comfortable where he was. So Harun would find out, then he would order him to be removed from that prison, sent to a second prison. Se same thing would happen in that second prison until finally Harun sentenced the Imam and sent him to the most vicious and cruel of the dungeons that he ran. And it was under the authority of a thug by the name of a Sindhi ibn Shahik, who was a Nasibi. He hated Ahl al-Bayt. He was cruel. He was vicious. He had absolutely no mercy in his heart. And he imprisoned al-Imam al-Kadhim, not in a cell, not in a prison like we imagine the steel. No, no, no. He imprisoned him, mothers and sisters, underground. It was like a grave that only had a small window on top so that oxygen could enter. It was like a grave. It was a dungeon underground that they say Al Imam Al Kadhim could not even tell if it was night or day because of how dark it was. The Imam could hardly breathe. He would come from time to time to that small opening just so he can get some air. When this vicious enemy of Allah, Sindhi ibn Shahik, would see the Imam come on top, come to breathe he would slap the Imam on his face and he would curse Imam Ali and Fatim alayhi salam. And Imam al-Kadhim would fall to the ground. And Imam al-Kadhim could no longer handle all this humiliation, all this torture. He went and he prayed and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save him, to end the torture. So the Ya Mukhallis al-Shajar min bayni teenan min bayni teenan wa raml khallisni min sajni harun. Ya Allah, you are the one that can save anyone from anything. I ask you to save me from the dungeon of Harun. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam did not stay too longer after that because Harun once gave the orders to as sindi to poison Al-Imam Al-Kadhim. They gave him poison, but that poison was a type where it slowly killed Al-Imam Al-Kadhim. Then to deflect any accusations against him that he killed an Imam al-Kadhim, he brought some of the Shia of an Imam al-Kadhim that same day in the dungeon so they could see their master. And he told them, look, your Imam is fine. There's nothing ha wrong with him. So if he dies, it has nothing to do with us. We're not liable. The Imam alayhi salam was approached by his Shia. One of his companions by the name of Ali ibn Suwayt told him, my dear master, when will you come out? When, when can we reunite with you? And we can come and pray behind you and learn from you. When will that day come? Ya ibn Rasulullah, that we can see your holy face amongst us once again. The Imam told him soon, O oh Ali. Ali told him, but when? Give me a day. He told him on Friday on a specific bridge called Jisr al-Rusafa. It was a bridge in Baghdad. You will see me there, inshallah, on Friday. Ali ibn Suwayd was happy. He thought that the Imam would be released on Friday. He went to the Shia in Baghdad and he informed them. He brought to them the glad tidings that the Imam will be released from prison on Friday. So they all came on Friday waiting for their Imam to be released. But instead, all of a sudden, they saw a few of the thugs of Harun, of the porters, the soldiers. They came carrying a coffin with them. They came and they threw it on the ground. And then they said, Hada Imam al-Rafidah. This is the Imam of the Rafidah, the Shia. That day, up to this day, they are called by the enemies Rafidah. And it's a condescending term that they use to disrespect the Shia, meaning that they reject the truth. So this is the Imam of the Rafidah, of this sect, meaning the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi Ali ibn Suwayt says, what is this? 
says, I went, I uncovered the uh, coffin. I noticed it is my master, Ali. It is my master, Musa ibn Ja'far. Yes, he promised me that on Friday I will see him, but I never thought that I will see him dead in a coffin. Aywa imama. He said, I began to cry and scream, Sayyidi Mawla, Ya Musa ibn Ja'far. Ah, wa salli ala Musa ibn Ja'far. Ya May Allah grant you the ziyara of Imam al kazim in Baghdad. When we go and visit the Imam, we read, and the ziyara, peace be upon you, O Musa, son of Ja'far. And then we describe who the Imam was and what he went through. Al-Muttahati bil-Zulm wal-Maqbari bil-Jaw. Al-Mu'adhabi fi qa'ar al-Sujood. وظلم المطامي للساق المرضوض بحلق القيود Peace be upon you, O Musa ibn Ja'far, O the one who was tortured in the dungeons of Harun in the dark small dungeons of Harun and they used to tie, they used to tie so much steel, and they used to tie the feet of Imam al kazim alayhi salam with chains so that he could not move. Wal janazat al munada alayha bidul al istighfar. Peace be upon you when your coffin was thrown and disrespected and they called out this is the Imam of the Rabbi Murtaba, only he say that in the sack. The earth and Maxo Wawala in Maslu Amr in Maglu Wadam in Matlobin was some in Mashu. But I tell you, Ya Musa ibn Jafar, that when you died, you were greeted by your grandfather, Rasulullah. He will be the one that shall avenge you on the day of judgment. You were greeted by your grandfather, Amir al Mu'mineen, by your mother, Fatima al Zahra. And they saw what they had done to you with your legacy, to your position. They had given, they had poisoned you to death. Assalamu alayka ya Mawla, ya Musa ibn Ja'far. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, let us raise our hands and supplicate to Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us of all our sins. We ask you to give us the ability and the tawfiq that we can follow in the footsteps of Musa ibn Ja'far. Ya Allah, allow us to learn from the teachings of the Imam. Unite us with the 12th Imam. Make us amongst the companions of the Imam, amongst the martyrs under Sahib al-Zaman. Grant us the ziyara of Musa ibn Ja'far and the rest of the members of Ahlul Bayt in this dunya. Grant us their shafa'a in the next life. And let us end by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for all the Mu'mineen and Mu'minat that have died after Salawat for Muhammad al-Ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد 